speaker is uh, Professor Stanton. Okay, thank you very much, Kathy. I want to thank the organizers for letting me participate as a speaker in the Richard Askey Day. Thank you very much. My talk, I'm gonna talk quite a bit about hypergeometric orthogonal polynomials and what it was like to be a student <laughs> with Dick in the 1970s. Simultaneously, Jim Wilson was a student too. So we spoke to each other all the time. I'm gonna highlight three questions we had for Dick. Usually you might think that Dick had questions for us. Well, we had questions for Dick. And some of the answers uh, that he gave us turned out to be a little surprising. <laughs> Talk about that. And then three remarks for the future, how the same ideas might be used. There's a tiny, tiny photo of Dick. In fact, Liz is in this photo too. You can see them right in the middle here. This is taken from the 1999 Hong Kong meeting. I like to think of Dick in these large groups of people at meetings. Insight to offer on almost every single person. It was astounding. And he had another unusual, he could come up to you and tell you, you need to talk with that person over there, even though you had no idea who that person was. And he was almost always right. Well, in the 1970s, I was a student along with Jim Wilson, and as George talked about, there was this 1975 seminar on Wolfgang Hahn's 1949 paper, talking to polynomials that satisfy a Q difference equation. So this Wolfgang Hahn paper gave Q analogs of classical orthogonal polynomials and their measures, but every measure was purely discrete as it turned out. So the point of the seminar was to try to go through this paper, understand it, and see if there were things left out. To this, presumably you'd have to know some things about Q series. Jim Wilson was in this seminar at the same time. Here's some notation about orthogonal polynomials. In fact, it's a photo of Jim Wilson. In fact, most of us at this meeting have probably never met Jim Wilson because he didn't go to many conferences. And this is a photo taken in January of 1977, which I guess would have been 45 years ago. I happen to know this because this is excerpted from his wedding photo. I happen to be there. So let's see, what kind of problems were we looking at back then for hypergeometric orthogonal polynomials. Problem one is if you know the measure, can you find the polynomials? Know the polynomials, can you find a measure? Dick liked this little proposition down here, he called it a shortcut, that if you have a polynomials with three-term occurrence relation and they're all orthogonal with respect to some weight to one, you don't need to check anything else, then the polynomials are orthogonal. Three term plus perpendicular to one is good enough. This was a shortcut he was hoping to use a lot. And so in setting this up, the question is, are there three term occurrences for these higher hypergeometric series? So Jim Wilson began to work on that, finding three term occurrences for higher hypergeometric and Q hypergeometric from the well-known contiguous relations but he had an organized way of doing it. So here's a, a discrete part of the ASCII scheme. We have these five orthogonal polynomials, Charlier, Meixner, Krauchik, Hahn, and Dual Hahn. All of these have a purely discrete measure. And as you move up, you become more general and you have more parameters. Measures are summation theorems. The measure for the Charlier is just an exponential sum. A measure for the Krauchek is a binomial theorem. For Hahn is Vandermont's theorem. And the measure for the dual Hahn is something called the very well poised 4F3. Pretty quickly, Dick decided to junk his shortcut. He decided, I don't need to do that. In particular, once George Andrews came, he decided that they would just redo the entire paper and find more things and just do orthogonality all in one swoop. Don't need any shortcut. And to do that, he said, I'm just gonna prove that the linear functional applied to a polynomial times another polynomial is zero. You can do this for all polynomials of less than the degree of this when you're done. 
So the big question is, how do you determine this other polynomial? Here's a way of doing it for these Han polynomials. You don't need to look at the details. This polynomial glues onto the weight function and shifts the parameter and goes through. In other words, you use the same theorem to sum the weights or work this out. It's the same, just everything shifts. So this is what happened. We quickly jumped the shortcut, just did everything all at once. And Jim Wilson found a set of discrete orthogonal polynomials. The Rockhoff polynomials is set above the Han and the dual Han. These Rockhoff polynomials are four F3 is a one, and their measure was the very well poised 5F4 evaluation. How would they come across this? Dick knew that Hans and the dual Hans, their orthogonality came from association schemes. But also, he knew they came from calculations that Charlie Dunkel had done on characters of finite groups. He just had to think what other orthogonalities were around. And one thing were the three J symbols in physics. They had an orthogonality relation. Uh, the three Js were three F2s. Do a three F2 transformation, they turn out to be dual Han polynomials. Oh, there are these six J symbols. It happened to be a four F3. And it's not too easy, but they figured out how to do the four of three transformations to prove they were polynomial once you normalize them correctly. So these Rockas are at top of the discrete part of the ASCII. Compare this to the classical hypergeometric summation theorems. So this thing that I've circled here, the theorem is this one right here is the Rocka one. Dual Han, Han, binomial theorem here is Krauchek and uh, Meixner, and this is Chartier. Well, what about these two? What about Dougal and fast Salschutz? What about those evaluate? That was the first question we asked Dick. Why don't those two appear? Why don't we have orthogonal polynomials for those two? What did Dick tell us? He just told us, well, didn't quite work that way. We, we went away and we said, well, I don't know about that. And Jim Wilson figured out, yes, you can use those two, but you don't get polynomial orthogonality, you get rational biorthogonality. So that's question number one that we have to take. Here's question number two. If you want to find the explicit formula for the polynomials, there's this determinantal quotient. What is this quotient of expanding the polynomial in these powers of x? Then you have a bunch of linear relations. The linear functional applied to x to the k times pn is zero when k is less than n. So you need to solve these equations for the coefficients. That's a Kramer's rule, solving a bunch of linear equations. And when you do this, Kramer's rule, you'll get this thing right here. So we asked Dick, why can't this be used if we know the measure? If the measure is given, why can't we just use this? And Dick told us, well, he said he knew about that, but he said that never led anywhere. He negative about it all. I can see why he was negative. First of all, most of the hypergeometric polynomials do not have good expansions in terms of powers of x. Those discrete ones use the shifted factorial. That means if you want to write it in terms of these powers of x, you're going to have Stirling numbers everywhere. And these moments are also going to be sums of Stirling numbers, not some giant determinant with sums of Stirling numbers. Plus, Dick knew that, well, this doesn't even work for Jacobi polynomials. Jacobi polynomials expand in terms of 1 minus x or 1 plus. You again get some kind of a summation as an answer. Sounds like it uh, just can't work. Oh, Jim Wilson figured out, yes, it does work. What you need to do is get rid of those monomials and take some other polynomials that affect a shift of parameters in the measure. So you want to get rid of these powers of x and take in some other set of bases for the polynomials so that the analogs of the moments are nice. They're going to be nice if You've just shifted the measure and you know what the sum of the, or what the total mass is, so it should be no problem. Or it should be, can you do a determinant? All of the factors 
all the entries in the determinant are now just factors, no sums. Well, yes, Jim Wilson eventually figured this out. He did it pretty quickly for the RACA and then the Q RACA, and then later he got the whole ASCII Wilson polynomials this way. So these first two questions point out something that Dick told us. One of Dick's words of wisdom was, if a senior person tells you it, it doesn't work, don't necessarily believe them. But maybe it works to do something else, or they didn't think the absolutely continuous part. So these are the polynomials, the Jacobi, the Laguerre, and the Hermit that Dick talked about much. I don't remember him talking about these polynomials. And well, I know he was working on this kind of thing with Morad, mostly these three polynomials. Wilson figured out how to put something on the top up here. And his measure had four parameters. It was this quotient of gamma functions over another gamma. And it was another 4F3. In fact, it was formally the same as the Raka polynomials. Just the parameters were different. It looks like everything's working. Well, now we come to Q versions of all of this. See what's going to happen here. What about those discrete theorems? Well, there are Q summation theorems, the ones that George talked about, the very well poised ones, that are completely analogous to Q equal one. All that stuff should go through okay. It does. For the discrete cases, Hahn, in his 1949 paper, had some discrete Q Hermite and discrete Q Laguerre's. A little hard to figure out exactly what was going on. But Dick and George found some little and big Q Jacobis whose measures were purely discrete and several others would be the analogs of the absolutely continuous ones. It's looking like, well, is this it? Aren't there any absolutely continuous measures? The answer turned out to be yes, that there are. And the key discovery was that these Rogers 19, 1894 polynomials are a version of the Q Hermites. And here's their measure right here. This came about because of a certain classification theorem that Bill Alloway had on generating functions for orthogonal polynomials. It led to this work that Dick did with Moron on Q ultraspherical, where you add some more infinite products to the measure. Some inkling here of Maybe you can move up this chain for absolutely continuous things. That gamma quotient that Wilson had for the Wilson polynomials, you could think of having some kind of a Q gamma quotient. Somehow, maybe by knowing what the Asalam Chahar polynomials are, they came up with this would be a good measure. And they needed to know what the total mass was. It turned out to be a little bit of a problem to work out this integral. Originally, they had a proof involving uh, four sums and a giant sum of elliptic functions was a constant. And Dick found another proof having to do with functional equations. Points out why that Wolfgang Hunk paper never had any of these polynomials. Polynomials you need to glue on would be these polynomials right here. X is cosine theta. When this glues on, it just shifts A by a q to the k. These polynomials do not have a simple q difference equation. So all of the polynomials that are limiting cases of these or special cases don't have a good q difference equation. They won't show up in Hahn's paper and they didn't. Later, later as in the early 1980s or 1980, found a better q difference operator that acted nicely on this, and that's the ASCII-Wilson operator. And that gave a beautiful analog of the second order differential equation. These things should satisfy. But it was not the Q difference equation. That was the wrong operator. Oops, uh-oh. Let's see, uh, that's the end. Oh, I have one more question. This is, uh, while we're there, I know Morad was working on these Lamel and Q Lamel polynomials. What about these Lamel polynomials? They're hypergeometric functions. They're certain 2F3s. They have a relatively nice measure involving zeros of Bessel functions. And we see these on the ASCII scheme. Where are they? Well, Dick's answer to this was, well, these are just sort of different. 
think he said that to try to get us not to work on this. I think he thought this was not a good problem for us. He wanted to discourage us. He had, I think he think we had better things to do than this. Now we know, I can now tell you an answer to this that I didn't know until recently. Those things are limits of associated ascii wilson polynomials. They're not in the ASCII-Wilson scheme, but they're in an associated ASCII-Wilson scheme. So these associated polynomials were worked on by many people and finally, Borat and Mizan Rahman found a double sum formula for these associated polynomials in the early 90s. And these lamels, when you take a limit from these associated down to lamels, the double sum becomes a single sum. And you do get things like these two F3s. Well, I don't know, is there some ASCII scheme for these associated polynomials? That's been considered very much. Maybe there are other ones. There's some remarks about these ideas. Those classical summation theorems, they're the ones that go up through the very well poised part and the 7F6 Dougal's theorem. You can prove all of those theorems from just three things. The binomial theorem, the branch inversion, and this 3F2 quadratic transformation. Just those three things do all those well poised theorems. Dick about this, I asked him, do you know what an orthogonal polynomial interpretation of this transformation? No, was the answer. We still don't know this. At the 2F1 level, we do know the analog of the quadratic transformations, the symmetry in the measures. But for this, I don't know. 3F2 cubic transformation. You can do the same identical steps on the 3F2 that you did to the 2F1 using the Lagrange inversion, you'll get a new set of evaluations, new hypergeometric evaluations going up. Maybe there's a whole new set of orthogonal polynomials using these same ideas, or maybe there's new biorthogonal rational functions. Versions also of just this. That's remark number one. Remark number two. These are type R1 orthogonal polynomials that were considered by Morad and David Basson in 1995. Here's their three-term occurrence. The only difference is this extra X right here. A n is zero, you'd have just normal orthogonal polynomials. This orthogonality. L of X to the M times P n divided by, which comes from this last term here is zero. In other words, the vector space on which this L acts is bigger than polynomials and includes some rational functions. Notice if A equals zero, this would go back to polynomial orthogonality. Oh, there are type R1 versions of ascii wilson and Q-Rocka polynomials. Those do exist. In fact, maybe there's a type R1 version of McDonald polynomials. There's a type R1 version of something better than the ascii wilson it has five parameters and the measure has five things in the denominator and one in the top. And it's a 10W9. There's something better for the McDonald polynomials? I, I don't know. An ASCII scheme for these type R1 polynomials. Is there a version of Leonard's theorem? Leonard's theorem says any set of orthogonal polynomials whose duals basically are orthogonal polynomials have to be a subcase of the Kuraka polynomials. Well, there's something that Zadanov has done, which may say what the analog of this other equation should be. If there was such a thing, would this extra X mean something? Well, usually this X comes from adjacency algebras and graphs. What does it mean to have an X here? Something that's rather embarrassing. What about the location of the zeros for these polynomials? You have interlacing, are they real? Do you need something to be positive definite? I don't know anything about that. But I think this, these type R1s are pretty much an open area. There are some combinatorial interpretations of these things. But for these basic questions, I just don't know. Well, for the third and last remark, I wanted to show you a theorem that Dick had 
his own theorem that he really liked. So he told me this theorem, he said he really liked this theorem. It has to do with linearization of polynomials. Suppose I wanna take a product of two polynomials and expand in terms of polynomials. I get some coefficients. This theorem said, if the preterm occurrence coefficients are increasing, Lambda positive, well, lambda positive, you need for positive definiteness. And then these linear equation coefficients are positive. You get a positivity condition out of just increasing Bs and lambdas and positive lambdas. Well, it'd be really nice if this models some symmetric function version for positivity, some sort of motivation. We don't know about this. It'd be very nice if there are a version of this for type R1 polynomials. We have B, lambda, and A. Would the same theorem be true, just the Bs, lambdas, and A's increasing? Something replacing this for positive definiteness? For example, here's A333. If you notice here, this has a lot of differences of Bs, but if they're increasing, these are all positive. Every term here is positive if the b's and lambdas are increasing and the lambdas are positive. Now, if you were just to write out the answer without these factors like this, it would be not so easy to come up with this. Well, finally, I want to end with a nice little photo here. These are some of the uh, mathematical progeny of the people. Sean Cooper, who we'll talk later today. This is Laura Chahara. And there's Dick himself. There's Tom Kornwinder, who already has spoken. There's myself, and this is John Green. You know, this probably is less than one-tenth of one percent of the people Dick has <laughs> influenced. It's gotta be at least a thousand mathematicians he somehow influenced. I'm happy to be one of them. Are there any questions? Um, could I ask a little side question, if I may? Um, it may reveal my ignorance, but what's the story with Jim Wilson subsequently to what you've described here? Jim Wilson got a job at Iowa State University and he, he stayed there for his entire career. I think he retired now. He didn't really work much in special functions three or four years after he got his degree. You might notice that his paper with Dick was 1985. So there was kind of a time lag there, even though many of the results were known in the late seventies. We tried to contact him, but sometimes it's not so easy. Yeah, in, in uh, I think in 2001, there was a big conference in uh, Minneapolis associated with um, um, uh, ideas about the DLMF. Uh, and, and there he was, at least he was there for one day. He I, did come I, for one day. I do remember that he was there for one, not yeah, very yeah. long though. Uh, I've, I've taken a photo of him. I talked with him, I took a photo of him. So you have a photo of him, wow. Yeah, I, I can send it to you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Is there any, are there any other comments or questions? Uh, yes, um, yeah. um, Dennis, uh, in the beginning of your lecture, you had this uh, determ determinantal formula, which is well known. And then you said that is also such a formula if you replace the monomials by something else. Yeah. But um, uh, does it still have the same form, that formula? No, or? no, you have to change these moments. Yeah, yeah, of course. You, you know, you have to you take have to... L of whatever that polynomial is with another polynomial expanding in terms of that basis and then saying it's perpendicular to some other sets of polynomials. Yes. And then you, you have that, instead of having X to the I plus J, you might have FI times GJ, L of FI times GJ. That's what happens in the type R, type R1 polynomials. Mm -hmm. There's theorems like this here too in that case. And you have to use these other, other bases. But this determinant of the system always factors. In this case, it's this product of the lambdas. Mm -hmm. For the type R1, it's more complicated than the product of the lambdas, but it still factors. It's described beautifully in Jim Wilson's paper, uh, Tom. Okay, I'll look at it. Yeah, 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 yeah exactly. Is there anything else? Any more remarks or? Maybe I can, I can yep. 
say something? Right. Um, Dennis mentioned, you know, these two instances where uh, Dick thought, you know, something will not work, but then it worked. And uh, he was later on, later in years, he was he always said that he was blessed to have two students who did not listen to him. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> let, let me let me add add to this that so you know, when when he when Dick realizes that he thought something and then it's not exactly correct, he not only changes his mind, he actually becomes extremely encouraging and uh, supportive of of the ideas. You know, I remember there was a seminar in 1977 in medicine, and I, he gave me a problem for trying to find measure for certain set of polynomials and related to the Polachek polynomials. And I asked him if the Polachek memoir worth reading. I mean, it's in French and it's, you know, it's like 60 pages or more. So he said he's not sure because the examples that are at the end, he can do all these examples without reading a 60 page paper in French. So it's not clear that this is useful. So I asked Paul Nevi there at the time, and if I said, no, 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 this is this is a good good thing to do. So anyway, Paul and I read read the memoir and we presented in the seminar because there was this seminar, it, we, it met four days a week. Uh, for the summer. And after I lectured about it, within like three days, Dick used this technique, which is due to Polacek. And, you know, I slightly modified in this joint work with Dick. He used that to do the weight function for the Q-ultraspherical and for the Aslam Chihara. He did the whole calculation, followed exactly the same. And he said, yeah, this is a very powerful technique. We should really all learn this and so on and so forth. And then after that, he was very supportive of this direction. Oh, so, he, you know, he was amazing when, when, when he was, you know, he was mostly right. And even in the few cases where he was not exactly right, he was very flexible. Interesting. Yeah. Any other questions? Then let us thank the speaker again. Thank you, Dennis. Sure. Well, actually, I have a, a really quick question. Do you remember um, when they they got the uh, ASCII Wilson weight function and they got the orthogonality and that was all worked out? What was what was that like? I mean, to be there when that happened was it was it exciting? Was it what? They knew what the measure was, but they had this problem of proving the ASCII Wilson integral that was kind of gumming up the works and they knew what the answer was, but that was not so easy. That sort of slowed things down a bit. To get the norm? Yeah, you, in order to get that, you have to, the exact formula, you need to know the shifting of the parameters. You need to know, that's the fact you have to divide by to get norm equal to one. So the shifting of the parameters would change all those shifts out in front. That was complicated. Their first proof, did a contour integral and then a sum of four infinite sequences and they were all very well poised and it was a, a kind of a big mess. And then Dick found a much simpler proof, not something they did immediately at all, even though they knew all the pieces fit together. They already knew the norm and they, they knew the measure. You know, Dick at the time began to get interested in the multivariable things, you know, multivariable beta functions. Or he was, knew, he knew these McDonald polynomials are gonna show up. You know, his interest is going more in that direction starting around 1980 or so. Anything else? Thank you, Dennis.